start by introducing myself. I'm Africa Gomez. I'm a lecturer in, uh, in biology. I'm in the research group EvoHall. And um, a provisor here, I, my research has nothing to do with human evolution, although I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, my research is centered around triops, some uh, little crustaceans of temporary ponds, and I'm interested in how the uh, sexual systems evolve. Uh, but I've been interested in human evolution for a long time, and I've been teaching it as a subject, uh, in fact, as a third year module since 2011. And science communication-wise, uh, I keep several blogs uh, on bird behavior, uh, natural history of invertebrates that you're much welcome to visit. So having said that, oops, I'm going to put like a reflective slide. I, I found this uh, word cloud that sort of summarizes uh, a range of topics that are nowadays on the news for not the best reasons. And I won't say much about politics, um, but the purpose of this uh, lecture is just to make you aware that I believe that uh, evolutionary biologists can make a big contribution to society by informing and by educating the public about what have we learned uh, about or how genomics and human evolution as topics can inform how we see ourselves and what can we do about these topics in the day-to-day -to -day life. So these are not socks. They are uh, the human karyotype, the set of 23 chromosomes that pretty much everybody in this room, I believe, share. Uh, if you have good eyesight, you might notice that the last pair are hot socks. So they are the sex chromosomes, and this karyotype this shows that this is a male karyotype, as males have a Y and an X chromosome. So most of you know, probably, that the human genome uh, was sequenced um, in the early uh, 2000s, and the human genome is made up of 3,000 million base pairs of DNA. In the 2001, we have one human genome. Nowadays, we have hundreds of thousands of human genomes. When the human genome was sequenced, it was incredibly expensive. It was $100 million to sequence one genome, whereas the cost has, has gone down massively. So it seems that it's a bit plateauing now, but the cost now is around $1,000. And these dropping costs have happened because there's been a phenomenal uh, progress in the technology to sequence genomes in general. It's not only that we have human genomes, we have a range of genomes that lots of animals, plants, uh, bacteria, etc. So nowadays you can sequence a human genome. This was in the news two weeks ago or last week. Uh, on the photo at the top, um, you can see uh, a very uh, modern sequencer that can sequence a human genome in, an, in a little machine that you can plug onto your uh, laptop and is not much bigger than a, than a phone. So, but how much variation there is in our genomes? So, if you're prepared to pay like 100 pounds or something like that, you can send a spit of your saliva and get lots of different spots in your genome, lots of sites, genotyped by a range of uh, ancestry uh, companies. What they really do, they don't sequence the whole of your genome, what they really do is that they type some sites, like half a million sites, a million sites in your genome that are known to be variable. These sites are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, for, sh for short they're called SNPs, and <coughs> we usually have in a genome a variant site, a SNP, every thousand base pairs. So you will have identical thousands base pairs 
and then a variable site. So these companies will type that variable site. So for, for example, you have here two stretches of DNA, and that is the SNP, that is the polymorphic site, that one of the copies in your DNA, the one you inherited, for example, from your mom, will have an A, and the copy you inherited from your dad will have a G. And often these sites are relevant for ancestry, they can give you information about ancestry, but they can also give you information about health. So about 20 years ago, people started being able to extract the DNA and to sequence the DNA of fossils. This might come as a bit of a surprise, fossils and fossils rock. Well, DNA is actually present in very small amount in all fossils, up to half a million or even a million years old. So as an organism dies, the DNA starts breaking down and it starts fragmenting because of bacterial activity and chemical activity. But in certain conditions, for example, in dry and cold conditions, like for example in caves or in permafrost, long enough bits of DNA are preserved that can be sequenced. So in 1997, uh, the first stretches of Neanderthal DNA were sequenced, and those are the stretches. It's a, it's a relatively small, uh, about 300 base pairs of mitochondrial DNA. Today we have complete genomes of um, three Neanderthals, several other archaic uh, uh, hominids, and thousands of ancient humans that live here in the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and farming uh, eras, like thousands of years ago. So you might think, well, this DNA that is so fragmented, how can we trust that it's the real thing? Well, surely DNA that is in fossils is contaminated with modern DNA. When the, when the archaeologists find these human fossils, they usually pass it around each other and they handle it a lot. So they are contaminated with modern DNA. But the modern DNA is in much bigger chunks. So, and it's also unmodified. So using bioinformatic techniques, we can separate now which is the truly ancient DNA and which is the modern DNA. And this is repeatable. If two different labs split the bone, separate it, analyze it, they reach the same sequence. So we can be pretty sure that when we have an endothel genome, it's really an endothel genome. It's not an artifact. So something that I find really beautiful about the field of ancient DNA is that we not only can have the genome of these fossil or fossil materials, we also have the archaeological context. So when there's a publication of a, of a genome from an ancient individual, usually archaeologists are also authors. We not only have the variation of the genome, we can date the material, and we know if they use wheels, what type of pottery they have, what tools they have, if they made uh, uh, fi Venus figurines, for example. Uh, the bottom uh, tools are the tools that were carried by Otzi, the Iceman, that was discovered in the, in the boundary between Italy and uh, Austria, I think. And it was a Neolithic uh, farmer. The population from which it came was a Neolithic farmer. So I'm going to convince you of several statements that are informed by uh, human evolution, given the background that I've given you. So the first statement, which was one of the first findings of human evolutionary genetics, is that we are all Africans. I've taken this, uh, this photograph from the Human Eye Project of a uh, Brazilian photographer, Angelica Das. I really recommend that you watch her TED talk, it's fantastic. And it, it illustrates the fact that we all humans see ourselves as very diverse in skin color, hair curliness, or no shape, or lip shape. But this superficial variation really hides the fact that we are a very homogeneous species genetically. 
So humans, as a species, have very little genetic diversity. We now have the genomes of all the great apes. And this, this tree on the left shows the relationships, the tree of our closest relatives, including the subspecies of chimps or uh, gorillas. So on the right hand side, you have a graph of heterozygosity. I told you before, it's an it's a, it's a easy number to remember, one in a thousand base pairs, approximately, is where you find the SNP. That also gives you a measure of heterozygosity. So the, the more SNPs you have, the more heterozygous your genome is. So this heterozygosity, number of SNPs per base pair, uh, if you look at the, at the square, shows what is the heterozygosity in non-African and African populations of humans. And as you can see, they are in the low end of the great apes. Compare the heterozygosity in orangutans, that is on the sort of towards the right hand side. So only the bonobo, as a species, has more or less the same genetic diversity than us. Okay? And probably many people struggle in telling apart a chimp and a bonobo. They look pretty similar. Not only the genetics, the fossils show that the earliest modern humans were African. Uh, this was also recently on the news. Uh, there were old findings that were redate, uh, redated with more modern techniques, and they are now the earliest known modern humans. They live in North Africa. And these uh, join a series of other uh, modern humans, like the Floristars in South Africa, and the East Africa Herto uh, uh, skulls and, and skeletons, that show that 300,000 um, years ago, modern humans were spread all around Africa. With the advent of genomics, we now have the human family tree. So this is uh, all the genomic variation of people summarized in a phylogenetic tree. Phylogenetic trees are usually not very good to depict the variation within a species because you force the species to split without gene flow. And we know this is not true. But if you look at this family tree, it shows you the geography of this tree. And the brown little branch on the left, you probably can't read what it says in the, uh, in the labels, that is all humans that don't live in Africa. So that tiny branch that is called brown are all non-Africans. So, as a species, we are an African species. So, the bit of human, humankind that is not in Africa, they are a, a recent offshoot. And this offshoot came from a migration that happened around 60,000 years ago. And this brings me to the second topic of the day. We are all migrants. So when we first migrated, or our species first migrated outside Africa, it didn't stop there. We haven't stopped migrating through our uh, history. And if you study history, you will be very aware of various uh, human migrations. The Vikings, the Normans, the, well, you, you, you can carry on camping. But this is not a recent phenomenon. This goes back to prehistory. This is a, a very interesting review that summarizes known uh, documented migratory patterns between uh, regions. And as you can see, for example, the bottom is Australia, and Australia is a particularly isolated uh, human group. But still in Australia, there's influxes of uh, various populations. And all the sort of cross lines between uh, geographic regions document uh, particularly known events of migration. Many of them were migrations uh, spurred by uh, uh, de technological developments. For example, the wheel and the domestication of the horse spurred some uh, very important migration, but also migrations that were involuntary, driven by uh, slavery or colonization. Many papers document that the populations uh, in Europe today descend from various waves of migration. For example, farming 
uh, uh, was brought into most of Europe due to migration from uh, Anatolia and uh, um, sort of the area occupied now by uh, Turkey and Greece. And also there were massive migrations from steppe areas that were driven by pastoralists, pastoralist groups. I want to show you this. Um, it's a graph that it might take me a minute or two to explain what it is. But um, in this data, researchers used 230 individuals that were sampled between 6,000 to 300 uh, BC, so very old archaeological individuals of known day, date. So they were carbon dated, the culture where they lived was pretty well known. So they had a temporal sample of human populations. And what they looked at is that half a million SNPs in these samples. So this plot is called a Manhattan plot. Manhattan, because of the skyscrapers. So each of the dots is a SNP. And it shows you how the divergent that SNP is between groups. So if it has one allele or the other allele. So most of the SNPs create a sort of a horizon, which is quite low. Those are, those, these, these SNPs are showing that the populations in Europe between 300 uh, AD and 6,000 AD didn't really change much across those SNPs. Those SNPs are really close to the bottom. The SNPs that stick out, the points that create the skyscrapers, are those that have diverged a lot between the ancient samples and the new samples. So those are called candidates of selection. So the reason why they have changed in frequency so much is because there's been some selective pressure that hasn't really changed the rest of the genome, but has changed those particular SNPs and the SNPs that are nearby, because they are often sort of driven by hitchhiking, by selective forces. So these are, on, there are only 12 SNPs that are significant, and those are above that red line, uh, dotted line. So the top hit is the lactase persistence gene. Can you raise your hand if you can drink milk without ill effects? Okay. Anybody that can drink milk? Two, three? Okay, that's sort of what I would expect. Good. We'll save that information for later. Um, so, these uh, lactase persistent uh, SNPs are pointing at the gene. In most mammals, uh, the ability to digest milk drops really quickly after weaning. So most of these class are very weird mutants, including myself. We are able to drink milk as adults. For a mammal, that's pretty weird, okay? So that particular allele that allows us to digest milk had an incredibly strong selective pressure in the last 4,000 years only, okay? This didn't exist before 4,000 years. When they look at this SNP in the oldest samples, it's not there. So you would conclude that the individuals before farming, and not only before farming, uh, before 4,000 years ago, when they were already farmers, these farmers weren't dairy farmers. They wouldn't be able to digest the milk. In fact, Otzi, this Iceman, wasn't able to digest the milk. There's other... Uh, Skyscraper, skyscraper genes, sort of genes under selection, that are involved in diet. So this ergothionine absorption gene has also a very strong signal. We don't really know what it does. We know that ergothionine is, um, is a rare amino acid. Some people see it as a kind of a vitamin that is not very common in uh, farming diets. It's particularly common in mushrooms. So you would think that probably hunter-gatherers were happily absorbing enough ergothionine from their diet. However, farmers, maybe they had trouble absorbing it. 
There's also genes involved in fatty acid metabolism and in vitamin D levels. And then you have the second tallest skyscraper is a light skin pigmentation gene. Well, it's a pigmentation gene, and the light allele is the one that has gone very strong selection. This increase in frequency earlier than the lactose persistent gene, so the earliest samples in which it appears is around 6,000 years ago. And it seems to have arrived into Europe and then increased in frequency after farming arrived in Europe. So I think that sort of summarizes what I want to say about this. Just to say that there are not many genes that have changed. One, is one of the most important that we can understand is the lactase persistence, and another one is the light skin gene. It's also something I would like to mention is that there's many of these genes that are under strong selective pressure that we don't really know what, what they do. So that is room for science to increase in the future. What are these, these genes doing? Some of them are related to immunity, but what immune factors? Some people have hypothesized that maybe tuberculosis was involved in the selection of this, probably because people started living in, in more dense uh, populations, but that's nothing that is as clear-cut as the lactase persistent and the skin collagen. Bring Cheddar Man, who hasn't heard of Cheddar Man this week. It's been in the news for the last 48 hours. Very good timing. Mm, very, very good timing. So, if you know what was in this slide, which is a paper from 2015, you might not be surprised to find out that uh, an individual from 9,000 years ago had dark sk darker skin and wasn't able to digest milk. It's not really surprising if you've been following the field of human evolution. Okay? I want to mention that an earlier reconstruction of the Natural History Museum showed a very pale skin uh, cheddar man. Can you read this? This is a selection, not a random selection, okay? But it's a selection of uh, comments after the news of the <coughs> cheddar man from the Daily Mail. <coughs> I find it interesting to look not only at the comment, but also at the, at the likes and the dislikes. It's very informative. Leave you a few seconds to read it. I like the time machine one, it's brilliant. Right. We carry on. We can discuss later. Okay, this brings me to the third to the third part of the of the talk. I want to convince you that we are all up next. Okay. Uh, this this watercolor, which I really love, is from uh, from an article in the Guardian. Uh, it's a writer that was talking about purity and how. Nobody can be purer than others, and it's a beautiful piece about what writers can do about these concepts of purity today. So I think that evolutionary biologists can do something to dispel some myths. So, if you have used one of these genetic companies and spat on this tube and send your sample away, you will have a very good idea of what your, uh, uh, your genetic diversity, and you will get some information about your ancestry, etc. And um, this is, this is uh, an image from a, from a blog, Kitty Cooper's blog. She's, uh, she's really into gene genealogy. And she managed to send spits of all her great-grandparents to one of these genetic company. That's quite a feat, that all, all her great-grandparents were alive. That's brilliant. So anyway, she, she sent all her grandparents. Then she did some trickery so that she colored her chromosomes by the chunks of DNA she had inherited from each of her grandparents. And it's a very colorful genome. But all of our genomes are a bit like that. 
they are made of a bit like a, one of these kilt throws that are made of bits of, of uh, material from different colours and different textures. Our, our genomes are made of stretches of DNA from all our ancestors. A patchwork kilt. Right? So some of us know that we have ancestors from different geographic regions. Some of us know very little about our recent ancestry. But if you do the spit and send your DNA to these genetic genealogy uh, companies, you will be, if you have a rich ancestry like this person here, which is probably from uh, South America, you might have uh, European DNA, which is in the blue, colored in blue. You might have chunks of uh, Native American DNA, which are in sort of rich orange. And you might have Sub-Saharan African DNA in pink. So people from many South American countries have uh, genomes that look a bit like this, different chunks from different geographic origins. But we don't have to, to have a very exotic ancestry to be at mixed. So all uh, Europeans have genomes that are made up of three ancestral groups. Uh, these, this graph shows what proportion of your genome is made up of hunter-gatherers, a bit like the cheddar man, so the same population where the cheddar man belonged, hunter-gatherers that live in Europe before farming arrived. You have some ancestry that comes from the Neolithic, which is in orange, related to Otzi, the Iceman, and a chunk, a sizable chunk of DNA, especially if you are from Northern Europe, that comes from the Eastern European pastoralists that brought in the lactase persistent gene, okay? Which I don't have any famous example to say, but I'm sure there'll be some. So this Eastern pastoralist uh, not only gave most of us in the classroom, our ability to digest milk, they also brought with them the root of our languages. All of us here speak English, and English is a in the European language. My mother tongue is Spanish, and Spanish is also in the European langui language. So this Eastern European pastoralist expanded with the combo of being able to digest milk and controlling the horses and the wheel, and they not only expanded towards Europe, they also expanded towards India. So there's a, a proportion of Indian languages that are also Indo-European. So people from India will have ancestors that they are also from the Eastern European pastoralists. And we all, probably most people that are in this room, share Neanderthal ancestry. So once we had a Neanderthal genome, people realized that there was a small proportion of our genomes that are very similar to the Neanderthal genome. And there was a lot of debate for a few years, could this be uh, uh, hybridization between our ancestors and the Neanderthals? Could this be due to some artifact? But this has been now uh, sort of shown quite reliably that the DNA that we have, that around 2% of DNA, that is very similar to Neanderthals, really came from an introgression event. There are several lines of evidence that support that. And one that is quite interesting is that the proportion of DNA in modern humans decreases over time. And this happens because there's still selection against some fragments of Neanderthal DNA that are deleterious in our genomes. Some bits of Neanderthal DNA have been selected for and have increasing frequency, but the, on average, we have less Neanderthal ancestry now than we had 45,000 years ago. With that blatant exception, which is a skull, yes? Oh yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. It's uh, K means thousand, 
like kilometers is is used very regularly as a as a yeah as an acronym. <coughs> yeah, that shows shows time and the proportion of, of DNA that actually comes from um, Neanderthals. So the the outlier there is a skull that was found in a in a cave in Romania quite a few years back. The paleontologist that found this skull remark that he had some features that were very reminiscent of Neanderthals, despite it being a modern human skull. And although they proposed that the hypothesis that maybe it was a hybrid, they were dismissed. Other people said, no, it's just not can be a hybrid. The Neanderthals were extinct by then, it can be a hybrid. So this individual had this skull had its genome sequenced. And it showed that he had a very recent Neanderthal ancestor. Not only he had a bigger proportion of Neanderthal than others at that time, but also those, that proportion was made of big chunks. So the bigger you have the chunk, the closer the ancestor is in your family tree. Because every time that there's a generation, the genome is partitioned into smaller chunks. Okay? And this brings me to the last part of the talk. We are all related, you and me. So I made my family tree a few years ago, and I went quite high up in some of the branches. So I know that probably you are not very closely related to me, or in all probability, okay? You're probably not my second cousin or third cousin. But, the number of ancestors, as we go back in time, doubles in every generation. That's the formula. So, three generations back, great-grandparents, you have eight. Ten generations back, you have over 10,000 ancestors. So it gets hard to do the family tree when you get ten generations back. It doesn't feel like that many generations, but the number really goes up. Twenty generations back, one million ancestors. If there is marriage between relatives, even if they're distant, obviously the number of ancestors won't be as big. Okay? But 20 generations back brings you to around the 1300s. This, in the 1300s, there was the Great Famine that coincided with two years in which there was very rainy springs and there was crop failures. People started feeding on the seed that they should have planted the following year. So they started to eat everything. They started eating the, the, the horses that they needed to pull things. So there was a lot of mortality, a lot of famine, and shortly after there was a great plague. So after that, population, for example in Europe, that had been increasing steadily, there was a big drop. So after those events, around the 1300s, there was 2.5 million people living in Britain. And put that together with 20 generations back, you have 1 million ancestors. So basically, half of the people that lived in Britain at that time were your ancestors. Probably all of them that left descendants. So probably if you are from England, you share lots of ancestors that lived 20 generations back. But even, if, even in Europe, you get two individuals randomly from Europe, let's say from Turkey, and it's almost outside Europe, but anyway, Cyprus and, and the UK, and you share long stretches of DNA that are indicating that you have ancestors in common. So Graham Cook is really interested in exploring this uh, genetic genealogy. How can we get information from genomes to see how many ancestors we share? So he's got a database of European genomes, I think it's 3,000 European genomes, and has looked at how many big chunks of DNA are shared by random individuals from different countries. And that's what is what's plotted there. So this is number of genome blocks shared with the UK and number of blocks shared with French speaking Swiss. Okay? And then the colors are individuals from different European countries. So if you compare it block shared with the UK, you can s 
see that around 250 blocks are shared with French individuals. So that means that you have at least 250 ancestors with a random French individual when you go back. Uh, I think that he did it in the last 3,000 years. The number of blocks decreases as you move away, but there's still quite a number of blocks shared. And let's go back to the lactase. That lactase persistence allele in Europe appeared only once. One individual had a mutation that allowed him or her to be able to drink milk when adult. All the people here that can digest milk had that individual as an ancestor. I had that individual as an ancestor. So I've shown you we are all related. We have a common ancestor, at least that individual that, that could, was able to digest the milk. So that puts an end to my lecture. Another word cloud, a bit more optimistic. Thank you.